All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And when I say everyone, I'm really pleased to say that this conversation has gone international, as it should. I'm really pleased to see the sign up today was uh, heavy in our community across the United States and then went international. So welcome from wherever you are checking in today for this very important conversation. Uh, today, today's topic is Radical Recreation, a conversation with Derek Adams and Allison Rose Jefferson. I am Masha Turchinsky, the director at the Hudson River Museum, and it is my pleasure and privilege to be able to moderate this program between these two renowned uh, figures. Um, and I want to say also that it's a real honor to be able to uh, address this important topic with you, um, especially during this critical time in our, in our country. Um, as uh, right now, I, I'm sure we are all aware on this call that our nation is reeling from deep wounds uh, of racism. And we at the Hudson River Museum stand in solidarity with our community um, in denouncing racism, systemic abuse, violence, and injustice. Um, and we recognize the myriad issues in our society that are unresolved and unattended. And we know that museums can express powerful ideas and advance agendas in society, but it's not, um, it's more than putting up a box. It's more than putting up a picture. It's about doing real work um, every day without stop. This is not going to be just a, this is not just something you do a program and you check a box and you're done. This is real work. And I wanna say thank you to Derek and Allison and to all of you on the call and to all of our staff at the museum and to our whole community in, in joining us in that work. Um, to bringing us along with you in this conversation. So today, um, in Radical Recreation, a conversation between Derek Adams and Allison Rose Jefferson, Derek Adams and, and Derek Adams and Allison Rose Jefferson will explore the theme of water in modern American history, from segregation to access, and from restricted clubs to public bathhouses, pools, and beaches to present day. The topic has particular resonance to the artist's work in Derek Adams' buoyant, as well as during this time of civil unrest, as many members of our community will directly experience the loss of even recreational out, out, um, outlets this summer during the pandemic. Dr. Jefferson will discuss her new book, Living the California Dream, Americans, African American Leisure Sites During the Jim Crow Era, which features an artwork by Derek Adams on the cover. Um, at, and at, Derek will address complexities of black lived experiences in his own art, I'd like to take a moment to read their bios. Um, we have two individuals who have accomplished so much, <laughs> so I would like to, to share some of their background before we begin. Derek Adams is a renowned multidisciplinary artist who has been working for more than 20 years in painting, collage, print, sculpture, installation art, performance, video, and sound. Recently hailed as trailblazing by Departures Magazine, Adam's, Adam's practice focuses on the fragmentation and manipula manipulation of structure and surface and exploring self-image and forward projection. In 2019, Derek Adams unveiled a permanent public art installation at the Nostrand Long Island Railroad Station at the Metropolitan Transit Authority, featuring over 30 colorful glass panels depicting Adams' rendition of the Crown Heights Brooklyn community where he lives and works. He is a recipient of the 2018 American Family Fellowship from the Gordon Parks Foundation. He is a recipient of the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Award in 2009. He's a 2014 S.J. Weiler Award winner, um, and the list goes on. Adams received his MFA from Columbia University and his BFA from Pratt Institute. He is, his art is in the permanent collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, the Whitney Museum of Art, and I would say proudly at the Hudson River Museum. And now I would like to read to you about Allison Rose Jefferson. Allison Rose Jefferson, MHC, PhD, is a historian and heritage conservation consultant. Her research interests explore the intersection of American history and the African American experience in Southern California, particularly during the Jim Crow era. Historical memory, public history, spatial justice, and cultural tourism with an aim to engage broad audiences through applied history projects in the struggle for social justice. Her book, Living the California Dream, American, African American Leisure Sites During the Jim Crow Era, published by University of Nebraska Press, 
arrived in January 2020, and it rethinks the significance of the struggle for leisure and public spaces for all in the long right, uh, freedom rights struggle. Dr. Jefferson earned her PhD in, in history from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and a Master of Heritage Conservation from the University of Southern California. She earned her Bachelor of Arts from Pomona College. Her work has garnered attention from, K, from KCET LA programming, the Los Angeles Times, and numerous other media outlets. You can learn more about her work at allisonrosejefferson.com. So a warm welcome to you both, to Derek and Allison. Thank you for letting me read your, um, your ample bios here today. Um, for everyone on the call, uh, my, my role as moderator today is to basically cede the floor to our distinguished guests. Um, and the way that we thought we would structure it is to, um, for Allison, um, Dr. Jefferson to speak, um, to, to lay some historical framework. Um, and then Derek is actually going to share uh, his, his thoughts behind his artwork. And then our, uh, after that, we will open up the chat to questions so that you can hear directly from the artist and historian. Allison and Derek, how does that sound? Sounds great. Sounds great. Excellent. All right. So with that, um, what I'm going to do is, um, uh, Allison, is I would suggest that you take it away um, and provide us with that framework and the uh, and the tenets of your of your work um, from your book. And I will hold them up. And I will, as we go through, forward with the conversation in the chat room, we will be supplying links where you can uh, purchase these books. Here's Allison Rose Jefferson's book and the illustrated catalog of Buoyant that accompanies Derek Adams Buoyant currently on view at the Hudson River Museum. So with that, Allison, I'm going to ask you to set us up for this conversation. Okay, well, thank you so much to the Hudson River Museum and to Derek Adams for inviting me to participate in this program. Um, we're, we're, we're getting used to our new world and, and these visual com these virtual conversations. So, uh, you know, we might have a few little technical glitches here. So just please excuse us. And maybe at some point in the future, we'll all have an opportunity to meet in person because uh, there'll be some other programming that works where Derek and I can, can um, meet you all together. Um, you wanna put the first slide up? African Americans began moving in large numbers to uh, Los the Los Angeles environs in the decades surrounding the turn of the 20th century, joining multi-ethnic uh, community, uh, joining a multi-ethnic community that in included whites and people of color, as well as immigrants from other uh, backgrounds. The majority of the new, Mac, uh, new black migrants relocated from American Southern states. Like those who moved to the Northeastern part of the United States, some moving to the area where you all are today uh, or where the museum is today. Um, African-Americans moving to California and other Western parts also acted to escape the worst of Jim Crow era racist anti-black restrictions. Next slide, please. Similarly to other groups who moved to the state, African-Americans also embraced the recurring booster promoted California dream of a leisure lifestyle, uh, of a leisure lifestyle as a permanent way of life in picturesque outdoor settings, a mild climate and new life opportunities even while discrimination and lax enforcement of California's civil rights laws a sta uh, 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 lax enforcement of California civil rights laws uh, established as early as 1893 uh, many times prevented them uh, from using uh, uh, various public and private facilities and buying land in many areas for decades into the 20th century. In my new book, Living the California Dream, African-American Leisure Sites During the Jim Crow Era, I explore how African-Americans made California and American history by challenging racial and class structures when they occupied recreational sites and claimed 
public space at the core of the state's formative mid-century identity. These places became sites of resistance in the development of attractive inland resorts and beaches relatively free from white citizens' harassment. In Los Angeles, recreation and relaxation were an essential component of liberty and, a, and, and distinctive civil concerns in the nation's long freedom rights struggle. Next slide. I offer a view of the overlooked extraordinary community builders and social economic development uh, experiences of black middle-class people in, uh, of Los Angeles and California's, uh, uh, California and the impact of leisure that intersects with the new scholarship about the influence of the diverse output of the Harlem Renaissance and the new Negro experience as a cultural phenomena uh, that was national and global in scope. These stories of unrecognized voices, economic development initiatives, and civil rights struggle add new information and understanding about uh, uh, how African Americans sought to seize their California and American dreams to appreciate and shape the offerings of their new environment in the far west. These stories I have reconstructed recast the significance, meaning, and place of leisure by recognizing African Americans' leadership and action, therefore giving a more complex understanding of the American experience and identity in the West and California where racial discrimination existed in practice rather than legal prescription as in many other parts of uh, the nation in the post-enslavement modern capitalist era. Next slide. In contrast to the city where Black Angelinos lived, California waterfronts and pastoral places uh, where they went to relax and, in, uh, and invested in real estate included uh, places in Los Angeles County, such as Bruce's Beach in Manhattan Beach. Uh, let's see, you guys can see the red dots are the locations of the places that I highlight the most in my book. So Manhattan Beach was one, and then another one in LA County was uh, Santa Monica's Bay Street Beach which was sometimes uh, controversially called the Inkwell, and uh, Eureka Villa in the Santa Clarita County, uh, in the Santa Clarita Valley area of Los Angeles County. In Riverside, there was Lake Elsinore, which is down here. And uh, also in Corona, there was the Park Ridge Country Club. And there are a few other places that I talk about as well in the book. These stories of California's largest and most popular, though not broadly uh, remembered, African-American relaxation destinations were sites of pleasure, identity, challenge to uh, racist anti-Black public policy and private practices, and economic development that flourished from, uh, for different times uh, uh, for different time durations between the 1900s to the 1960s. Next slide. These are the stories as well as public and private uh, memories of African Americans of all socioeconomic classes. The new Negro who migrated out of uh, the US South to Northern, Midwestern and far Western cities in the post-World War I decades to escape racial injustice. These migrants, including soldiers arriving home uh, from Europe after the Great War, were more self-confident and sometimes militant in demanding their rights as citizens and consumers. The consumption of leisure as part as a particular lifestyle and a performance vehicle of various social practices to gain fulfillment, self-determination, and uplift became a forceful new marker 
in the claim of middle class status, place, and American citizenship and culture that spread from California to the rest of the US beginning early in the 20th century. Race, power, privilege, and wealth often influenced and restricted leisure opportunities just as these factors determine who was able to take advantage of economic and social opportunities in Southern California. Even with these impacts, African Americans in their building and enjoyment of these leisure communities, uh, even with these impacts, African Americans in their building and enjoyment of these leisure communities through creative assertion claimed and performed full humanity, civil, uh, civic membership, social and economic development, resourcefulness, and self-determination. Next slide. This history is layered with stories about group and individual circumstances and chronicles about migration patterns, socioeconomic status, cultural practices, and education and employment opportunities and social power. These multifaceted intersecting and overlapping experiences and stories took place in private and public spaces. They are inseparable from, uh, from one another in their composition and reflection of the structural racial exclusion and class exploitation imposed on African Americans and other people of color. <clears throat> Just as the leisure and resort spaces in other parts of the United States were developed by African Americans during the Jim Crow era. In Southern California, African American leisure spaces developed to promote the interests of their community and advance a complex mix of political perspectives supporting freedom, economic development, um, and emotional and physical rejuvenation. The new Negro was determined to achieve a fuller participation in American society, in their cultural self-expression, economic independence, and progressive politics. Next slide. The experiences and memories of these leisure spaces and destinations and the attention they gained in newspapers of the era aided in creating public memory that offered African Americans new and broader visions of themselves. Uh, a new identity and new, a, a new collective sense of freedom and humanity contributing to cultural and intell intellectual efforts that defined the new Negro. In Southern California, African Americans' ambitions and initiatives for leisure space also radically claimed, challenged, and uh, promoted the region's identity in the consumption of leisure as a lifestyle that was spread across the country to develop new suburban and uh, to develop new uh, new suburban middle class culture. Black Angelinos challenged the era's white supremacist conventions about social space as they asserted self determination <clears throat> to participate in popular leisure and, 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 and resort cultural, social, and economic trends that were considered uh, modern by the 1920s. In ex-urban communities, African Americans bought property so they could control their enjoyment of these activities and contest anti-Black racism. Particularly, they were challenging whites, prejudice, and power in the, lab in the labeling of African Americans as laborers and as inferior. Next slide. Each site discussed in the book has its own history of the development of leisure of a specific sort in social, political, and economic particulars, as well as racialized issues of time and place. One of the earliest places African Americans went for recreation and relaxation was Lake Elsinore in Riverside County, 
a somewhat successful uh, residential and leisure destination for the general population and African Americans through the middle decades of the 20th century. This was one of the farthest inland of the African American leisure spaces that existed uh, during this era. Next slide. The vagaries of the lake condition, conditions and changing leisure tastes over the years impacted African American entrepreneurs, resort business opportunities and success. The African American presence has been left out of the local history narrative and landmark designation programming. This omission from the heritage conservation programming obstructs our understanding of the full shared history of the range of community builders and their impact and contributions to development of the Lake Elsinore community and California. Next slide. The Park Ridge Country Club in Corona in Riverside County was a private club and leisure space originally built for an elite white only clientele. A group of very ambitious African American businessmen, Jeune W. White, Dr. Eugene C. Nelson, and Clarence R. Bailey purchased the site to operate as an interracial space and an attempt at black community suburbanization and elite recreation in 1927. Next slide, please. The local elite, back a slide, please. The local elite and other racist white citizens strongly oppose the reorganization of this venture. The African American businessmen's efforts to make the venture a success have been left out of the local history narrative, thereby limiting uh, our understanding of, of the Corona community's historical actors and evolution. Eureka Villa, later known as Valverde, in the Santa Clarita Valley area of North Los Angeles County, was initially an African-American planned resort community development project with Bureau uh, American Partners initiated in 1924. Next slide, please. As early leaders of this project, uh, an early leader of this project was Black Angelino Booster and real estate impresario Sidney P. Domes. Public money contributed to the development of a park and swimming pool and multiple marketing uh, efforts by black and white boosters helped sustain interest of African-American consumer, consumers usage of this hidden canyon area until the crumbling of the racial apartheid era in the 1960s. By 2015, the Valverde community had been recast as one of the last rural areas remaining with affordable housing in the Santa Clarita Valley, Valley with a limited public memory of uh, the African American heritage. Next slide. Bruce's Beach in Manhattan Beach was an early successful African American residential resort and leisure destination, which opened in 1912. Eventually, racial prejudice, exclusionary measures, aided by destructive use of state power in 1925, eliminated their residential and economic development with attempts to erase the site's memory from history. Only through political assertion has a limited revival of the history, next slide please, of Bruce's Beach in the in its unincorporated and its only through political the history of Bruce's Beach and its incorporation into the public record emerged uh, in the first decades of the 21st century. In their first organized civil disobedience action 
in the region, members of the Los Angeles branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1927 challenged Manhattan Beach's official, uh, challenged Manhattan Beach officials when they tried additional measures to make the beach white only. Although Bruce's, the Bruce's Beach community was raised when the NAACP members staged a swim in protest and legal maneuvers, uh, clarification was one that African Americans had the legal right to enjoy this and all California beaches. In the coming decades, with their accomplishment, African Americans more confi confident uh, assertion of their legal rights contributed to racial restriction attempts at the state's public beaches fading away. As the 20th century advanced, African Americans around the US would increasingly utilize their actions and public protests to dismantle legally sanctioned along with informally enforced discrimination and segregation in public accommodation. African Americans were able to build a sustained community in the city of Santa Monica founded in the 1880s, a few blocks from the Pacific shoreline in the environs of what is today the Civic Center. Phillips Chapel Christian Methodist Episcopal Church the first African American church established in 1906 provided an institutional space for black life in the Bay City. A short way south was a Venice neighborhood, which was also part of the Santa Monica African American community. African American regional residents and Los Angeles entrepreneurs uh, attempting leisure service leisure space service business, business expansion for, for their community were challenged by various white supremacist poli uh, public policy measures uh, inhibiting residential expansion and economic development. Although African American citizens public beach usage and a small local residential community was able to, pers to persist despite Santa Monica's white elite racist uh, uh, a, a small, a, a residential community and the public beach uh, uh, access was able to persist despite Santa Monica's white uh, elite racist anti-black actions. The local African American community's persistence has mattered in the reclamation of place and memory in the 21st century heritage conservation efforts and public history programming that has been initiated by public officials and citizen groups. This and other Southern California leisure spaces marked an African American identity on the regional landscape and social space as they confronted the emerging, uh, emerging power politics of leisure space. The stage was set for these sites as places for remembrance of invention and public contest, contest and public contest. Next slide. Like many white Americans, black Americans were lured to California for its opportunities and the good life imagery produced and the good life in imagery, imagery produced by writers, painters, photographers, and movie makers, which were used by various boosters promoting migration to the state. The stories and imagery of African Americans <clears throat> who, um, the stories and imagery of African Americans who participated in various phases of the Western migration and settlement continue to, remind, uh, to remain largely absent 
uh, uh, from the dominant mythologies and histories surrounding the Western migration, notwithstanding investigation of um, the Black West published during the last 50 years. Today, I've um, briefly highlighted little known stories of African American leadership and socioeconomic investment in the California dream lifestyle at what uh, have been called frontier of leisure destinations in, the, in Southern California from the 1900s to the 1960s. I hope that um, you'll take time to learn about uh, these forgotten Western pioneers and their undertakings um, and also uh, uh, other African-American pioneers around the nation. Uh, but particularly, I hope you'll look at my book and, uh, and, and take a good read of it. Thank you so much for uh, our converse, our talk today. Thank you. Thank you, Allison, it was great. Thank you so much. So, thank you, Allison. <clears throat> so, I wanted to first start, you know, with these two images. The first ones that are on the list were images of uh, Martin and his wife, Coretta, enjoying a holiday at the pool. And starting with the very beginning of my work, as you know, my creative work um, from grad school, I was always interested in stories that were not um, as uh, forefront as other stories about African American history and the African American experience. And being an artist, I was always interested in the formal um, components of what that is to be an artist, to paint, to be interested in painting and sculpture. And those things are just my personal interest, yes, as a creative person, but thinking about content, I was always really interested in what to talk about mm -hmm. and what to uh, incorporate in the, the objects that I, was, you know, that I make as an artist. And so I became really interested in Black culture and consumerism as an American phenomena, but also a very normative part of uh, human existence, um, living in a, a society that's rooted in capitalism and the idea of American dream. And so I was always very focused on um, having those conversations because as an artist, I didn't see those conversations being very present in contemporary art made by uh, Black Americans such as myself and, you know, and my peer group. And so I thought it was very important as an artist, as a creative, to really think about the conversations that are, that are missing and the conversations that are necessary to, to create a more dynamic um, conversation about history and history of people who contributed to this thing we, we call America, American culture. And so leisure became of interest to me more so as a subject matter in 2015, when I was just looking for inspiration. And also, you know, as an artist, you always look for images to put with your words, the things that you think about, the things that you may overlook. I, I learned in grad school that a lot of the times where for art is something that's far of a reach for inspiration. Sometimes it's just the things around you that can be very uh, relevant to make a subject matter and to talk about um, in your work. And so um, in 20, 2015, <clears throat> I started to look, look at, you know, look on the internet, look for research because I became really interested in images of leisure, uh, the black body and repose. And I came across the image of uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, and it was, a, um, I think it was an Ebony um, publication and it was Martin Luther King and his family on vacation. And I, also, and I was really almost shocked. And, all, and I also felt um, like 
information was being withheld from, from me. Because when you think about Martin Luther King, even in education, there are rarely images of him or other leaders, civil rights leaders, in images of repose or relaxation or just enjoyment. And I became really interested in that as being a motivation for the Floater series. Um, and I started to make these images in 2015 because I kind of wanted to see images that were very different than the images that I was accustomed to seeing as an artist in exhibitions and um, museums and things like that. But I also felt it would be a challenge to put these images in the world and to have these images looked at as political images because I looked at them as very political because it showed an element of black culture and, and the black body in a way that was not subject to the same type of uh, oppressive structures that we see in art normally. And it's not that those, those particular positions of representation are not relevant, but I think that there's a moment in between where, you know, we, are, we live and we exist and we have moments of joy and gratitude and perseverance that are not exactly highlighted within visual art. And with my desire as an artist to make images that are provocative and interesting um, to the viewer with the formal training that I had as an artist, I'm interested in painting and color and things that are um, part of what my profession is. I'm also interested in um, narratives that uh, really um, promote the things I'm thinking about um, as objects. And uh, so the, the, the floaters came about in 2015 and I was really interested in how to represent the black figure in many ways that was f really familiar to me as a person and things, you know, I started to consider my environment and I started to consider my peer group and I started to think about the things that we do together and a lot of the leisure that we partake in on a daily basis when we have time when we're not working or not dealing with other social political issues there's moments where we're actually enjoying life and I thought how interesting that would be for people to see that side of my culture and the culture of American history in a way that is not normal for them to see, but normal for me to experience. And so I decided to kind of push this narrative to the forefront by creating uh, a series of works that capture very uh, various attitudes and um, within this theme of the floater, which are subjects um, immer you know, immersed in water um, with no framing of, um, of landscape around them. So for me, it was really more of talking about the idea of, of, of floating, being, you know, without weight. Um, and so I, I wanted to also to appear that it could be sky or water by removing the surroundings um, of the figures. I wanted to really show the level of care, carefree um, um, as, the, as the foundation of, um, of the work and the blue space um, I wanted to, to be sure that it, it could read as, you know, not just water, which is the motivation, but also it could be felt in a, in a level of, um, of uh, a, flotate, a flotation um, that could be compared to the air as well as water. And so that was the motivation for making the work. And I started it and I'm still, you know, in, in, uh, thinking about the work and thinking about um, images um, that, you know, that are part of the series. Um, because I always feel, you know, even as an artist coming into my studio is a motivation. And, you know, and I think that you have to also be excited about what you're doing in your studio. And for me, turning on the lights in my studio and seeing these works on the wall, um, bring me a certain level of joy that um, is contagious for other people who come into my studio. And I think that's part of being an artist too, is to create the world that you want to live in and the world that you feel is relevant for people to experience. And so this was kind of the motivation for our, this body of work. And, um, and it was exciting when um, I was invited to exhibit this work for the first time in a museum exhibition um, at Hudson River Museum. And 
one of the things that's really exciting about this work is I knew at one point it would be a, in a museum exhibition. And I didn't know where or when or, or those, you know, those facts, but I felt that this work would be um, necessary at some point in his history for people to see. I thought it would be um, beneficial for people to experience uh, this generation and the next generation to kind of look at this particular subject matter as um, something that is empowering for the generations um, now and the future. And I never really thought about this work as being positive work. I, I felt like this work was really about a normative side of, of culture that I participate in. And I always say when people say that the work is positive or whatever, <clears throat> I always kind of laugh because I think that's where the challenge lies is to see the black figure in repose and to see a black figure on something that seems like a leisure object would, would be considered as a positive work. But if the figure was not black, it would just be seen as a work um, of joy or whatever um, it would relate to for, this, for the viewer, but it wouldn't be attached to this idea of trauma and, and positivity, you know, because I know that matter for me, very much part of my, um, my American experience um, and it's the experience of a lot of my peers and family that participate in this act. So for me, it was almost like, what is the most contemporary way to capture the, a portrait? What is the most contemporary, contemporary way to think about portraiture and uh, subject matter? And what would be the best platform to present an image of uh, the figure um, in the way that we see portraiture today? So for me, it started really thinking about the history of painting and the history of portraiture and what I could bring to the table as a contemporary artist to talk about things that I thought were interesting, knowing the history of uh, black culture and black leisure, um, but how strong and how important it is to think about it in relationship to uh, American history, because I think these objects that I'm using in the paintings are much, much more identified as something that Americans use. And I've heard it from people who are not American about how this is so much like something you would see in American culture um, in a lot of pools. And I mean, now it's much more international, but when I first started to incorporate these into works, um, people, you know, didn't, didn't know how to describe them as, um, as objects relating to um, these kind of really inflated um, figures or objects. But I, I looked at them as very much being a part of like how we kind of like do things kind of over the top and how we think about consumerism in a very different way. And I wanted to use this object as a way to talk about the importance of leisure, the way, the way leisure is, um, is in, you know, how it's used, um, who gets to do it. Um, the fact that, you know, the idea of normalcy um, and positivity becomes, a, you know, some of the topics of discussion with this work that I always think are challenging. And I, you know, and I would love to see a work like this by another artist that is displaying um, very literal challenges with oppression. I think it would be a really interesting way to see something like this compared to another image by an artist that is displaying another more familiar image of black struggle. Um, I think that would be an interesting tension and I always think about that with this work, you know, how this work would be more challenging for a curator to put in a museum by a black artist to talk about things that are politically and socially um, challenging for us um, and in a culture to put this in a museum or to put this in a space and talk about it in a way that is about much of what we can, can consider a challenge and, and uh, an obstacle for us to put this image out there and to be able to deal with it and talk about it in a context that is not just about um, fun, but how fun for the black figure is very political and very radical because in some places people don't really believe that we have um, the time for fun. You know, we don't, we don't have the, um, the, the, the freedom for leisure, those things when so much is going on, how can you have fun? How can you be happy? 
this just happened, that just happened. Why are you, why are you uh, presenting images that are not um, acknowledging the trauma in life? But I think the fact that we're still here, that we're existing, that we've had all these traumatic experiences in our time here in this country, that we've still managed to keep our, um, our civilization. We still managed to keep our um, humanity and the, and the fact that we still have time to gather and to be together does not mean that we've um, forgotten about the struggle. The fact that we can have joyous moments in between these times are what we should be really pushing forward um, because a lot of the things that we've dealt with in, um, in America and around the world that has been a challenge for black people is not when we're necessarily protesting. The, the protesting comes out of people not allowing us to have leisure. A lot of the issues you see when you look online where people are, um, are challenging the black body, it's usually when we're minding our business. It's usually when black people are trying to have a barbecue or they're at a pool or they're driving down the street there usually are not places where they're doing something that's criminal or doing something that's radical to, to you know, considering what we think is radical. But to me, I think the existence of trying to participate in joy is, is offensive to people, is offensive to anti-Black people that think that Black people do not have the right to relax and to have fun and to have joy because of all the things that we've been through and that we belong in this particular place. But I think this is much more radical than images that I've seen of, of Black people in trauma, because this does not say that we don't experience trauma. It says that we're still here. We're still existing. We're still, you know, we're, we're having fun, but we're also talking about things that are important to us and that may, uh, may be radical, you know, because you don't see the radicalness in a literal form does not mean an image cannot be radical. I think that this image is is radical, even more radical of things that I've seen in art that I feel is, are predictable. I feel are things that people think we should have in the world versus what um, we should put in the world, you know, because I think that it's important to both imagery, but I think this particular imagery sometimes is, can be looked at as being the opposite of something that is considered radical or, um, or somehow mirror reflection of the the turmoil that we exist in but you know when i walk through my neighborhood regardless of what's going on in the world i still see people out with their families on the stoop i still see people out having a good time laughing talking about things i would never be um ignorant ignorant enough to think that they're not talking about other things that are radical i would not assume because they're laughing and that they're with their family and they're you know doing whatever they're doing, that they don't have trauma, that they're not participating in change. You know, for me to assume other because they're presenting themselves as being in a joyous space, that that's not a place they, they should exist in. And I think that for me was a motivation overall with my work as an artist, is how can I push this other narrative forward that younger artists will feel more inclined to talk about those things because I wanna know about what, how you feel about your family. I wanna know how you feel about things that are true to you that you can speak directly with. And I, you know, and I encourage younger artists or just artists in general to really think about the, the critical and political position of leisure and a, and a critical political part of representing black figures in the way that you feel is much more natural to you as a person without thinking that by doing so it will limit people's understanding of the struggle. Like I'm a black man, I can never forget about the struggle. You know, I can never walk out of my house and think that I'm free of the struggle. I, I, I understand my worth. I know what I deserve, you know, when I leave my house, but it doesn't mean that I'm free from persecution or anything that I'm subject to just from walking out of the door. So in my studio, I can talk about other things. I can speak on things that I think are empowering for me because my studio is my place to create um, realities that are not necessarily the realities that other people think are purposeful in times where people are feeling uh, hopeless. But I think the work I create or the work I wanna create is about hope, hopefulness and about reality in a way that has, you know, when I think about my family, I think about 
I smile. I think about family life. I think about friends. I think that's what I think about on a daily basis. The other things are, you know, issues and challenges that I feel will always be part of, of my life as a black person. And I deal with them as they come. But on my time where I have the ability to create a world that I want to exist in, I'm going to exist in a world that I can show my nieces and my nephews and my little cousins and people like that in my family and other people's family, just the type of black culture that they understand and a part of black culture that they um, participate in. And I want to bring that to the forefront with my work and the conversation surrounding my work, never negating the formal aspect of my work. Cause I'm really interested in formal dynamics, the way I paint, the way I think about creating sculpture is something that's equally relevant. Form and content are both two things that are very um, much my focus as an artist to make the work as provocative um, in form as it is in content. So those things are, they go hand in hand for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Derek. Um, I think the questions are going to start rolling in, but I have, I'll, I'm going to start with um, one that came up. I, I, I have, uh, I recognize in your work, you've both written about it, you've both spoken about it. Um, the, I wrote down a quote from, a, from a, a, both of you, uh, or, or paraphrased it, the idea of, um, that the most powerful thing is to be carefree, uh, or even to have the nerve to be carefree. Uh, you both, you have both addressed that. That idea of uh, lived experience is a very powerful tool, and and this idea of uh, being carefree is a normative, ex expected um, way of, of of life. That everyone deserves this. Black people deserve this, obviously or should be obvious. Could you talk about that idea? Both of you, you've, you've both talked about it, you've both written about it, you've painted about it, this normative experience of being carefree. Would either of you like to talk about that? So, so what I uh, have found so interesting about um, Derek and my uh, work is that we have these intersections about these ideas and we're approaching them in some ways in a similar manner and then in some ways just a, a little different from each other because I'm writing about them and so I'm collecting multiple stories and giving these individual stories into a collect uh, collecting these individual stories and putting them into these narratives that give a picture of the collective history of African Americans. And, and Derek is doing something of the similar thing, but he does it through one image uh, versus, uh, well, not one image, but say if he has a painting, he has a painting and it's representing maybe the themes of five different people uh, in terms of their stories that are similar. And so it's just really amazing to me that 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 he and I found each other <laughs> in this way, and in terms of looking at, at you know in terms of our work and in terms of looking at um, the issues of self fulfillment and freedom, a lot of people um, forget that that's what life is about, <laughs> and and so with that you know, we're, uh, we're sharing this information, me through uh, text narratives, him through visual narratives about people looking for freedom in um, their lives, their personal lives, their personal spaces, and freedom from the standpoint of relaxing. And, and in my work, it's how they got to relaxing at these particular spaces. They created these spaces for themselves in terms of their community and for their individual, their individual needs. And, and 
and that was important. And at the same time, in order to create these places that they were enjoying, they were working uh, someplace else on a job. And they were also, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> they were also participating in various levels of civil rights struggle in their home. But these places that they were recreating at were also these sites of resistance to the uh, white supremacist uh, conventions of the day. And in terms of contemporary times, some of that has still followed through because of the fact that um, we have structural racism, uh, anti-blackness that has, has continue to permeate our society and it's, it's, it's allowed for us to be excluded from certain activities uh, as African Americans. We can get there, but we, we sometimes have to go to a circuitous route or we might be insulted or uh, 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 told that, you know, ask questions that, that we don't need to be asked in terms of, you know, going to a pool and somebody says, well, do you have your pass? Do you have your key? Uh, and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Derek, um, is there anything you want to add to that? I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's always interesting with my work overall, because the thing about the work I make, and I look at it as being very unapologetic, it's not like a lot of like I don't, I don't try to direct the viewer to, you know, to understand the narrative beyond what is present. I see as many multiple narratives or stories that are more complex than what it could be seen from first glance. And I always think it's really interesting where, you know, when I have studio visits with curators or things like that, and you never know what curators are looking for when you have a studio visit. Um, as a black artist, I think most black artists feel this way, is that when people come and carriers come to your, to your studio, they always, I feel like they're always looking for the obvious narrative presented in a, in a creative way. And so when I have studio visits as an artist, I automatically think that I'm not gonna be in a, a show if I'm there to represent this idea of the black narrative. Not saying that I don't feel like I should be, I just feel like that's something that I never, it's not even I feel bad about it. I just feel like the work is just, for me, challenging for someone to kind of come into a space to see what I produce, not just this series of floaters, but the television series I've made, other images that I've made portraying the Black subject. Um, it's a context that I feel is not a one-on-one history context. I think it's a more advanced level when you think about the, the placement of the subject in the context in which I, I speak about them. So. Um, when Hudson River Museum asked me to do the show, we first, you know, started talking um, with both Masha and Laura Vocal, we uh, curator. Um, we were talking about other ideas, like we weren't even talking about this particular body of work because I rarely even promote this particular body of work unless I see interest in the work. And we kept talking about ideas for the show, and we kind of were talking about different things. And then I think Masha and and uh, and Laura said. What about doing the floaters when we had the meeting? And I was like, oh yeah, I didn't think, you know, you guys wanted to work, do that work, put that work out there. And they was like, no, we think it was a great, great idea. And you got to explain why and how relevant it was for the, to show it first in the museum at uh, Hudson River. And I agreed and I felt that way from the beginning, but I think that it's been a challenge just as an artist making what I make, you know, it's, 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 it's being received, um, has a positive reception from people just for the visualness of it, but the content of it as being very much political in the way I see it is sometimes hard, even complicated with a black curator um, because of the context in which the black artist plays a role in contemporary art in the society in which um, supports a certain or particular narrative of trauma, which is somewhat, um, a very more familiar and more promoted narrative within uh, museum structure and gallery structure, depending on the context. I mean, fortunately, I've been supported by, you know, great gallery programs and, and museum exhibitions in a lot of different ways. But I know it's to be a challenge because it, it 
automatically is um, a narrative that is not, for me, I think it's a no brainer. And I think that it's something that is um, not as promoted, not as politicized, which it should be. But I think that it's because of the nature of its um, um, formal application, as well as the context of where it comes from, it could be uh, a misguided uh, interpretation of the work based on what the expectations are from an artist like me making work um, in our contemporary society with the issues that we're dealing with. And I think that to me, I think this could be more um, of something that is uh, more reflective of the way that we live when we're, you know, when we're existing. I don't think, I personally come from a place where black people are not thinking about white people and what white people are doing to them all the time, even though that's issues that are happening a lot, a lot with black culture and anti-blackness in the world. But when we're together and we're with our family and we're hanging out with our friends, it's rarely a topic of us and them. It's usually a topic of us. And we become the, the main um, subject in our, in, our, in our narrative and our story. And that becomes more of the primary focus in our conversation. We're not thinking about other cultures and how other cultures are looking at us or thinking about us. We're thinking about how we can grow, how, the, how we uh, progress, you know, how we enjoy each other's time. And I think that you know, there are some narratives that kind of push this idea that we're constantly thinking about how we're looked at, how we're perceived. That's not, to me, the norm. And so for me, I think we're more focused on, like every other cultural group, we're focused on what we're interested in with each other as we're communicating with each other. And I think for me, that's a challenge to put those works out in the world and for people to accept those works, accept this, without, without forcing me to acknowledge a narrative of other or me pushing from, pushing, pushing from something else and for me to just present things that I wanna see, that I wanna see that is normative and that I think the normativeness of these works convey a sense of, of a visual challenge for the viewer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have, we've got questions rolling in and I want to um, share two to have you both start thinking about them. It, uh, they're, they're about your respective work. Uh, Derek, one question has come in about your choice of materials and that, um, and, and how did, how does your selection of materials and collage um, help advance your 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 vision for that normative um, the black body in repose and Allison if you could be thinking about in the meantime uh, there's a lot of questions coming in about the uh, the images you chose for your research how you found them why you chose them um, well for my work like the materials I use first I start with what's around my neighborhood I spend moments where I just go to the dollar stores I go to the fabric shops I go to the to the, you know, I do window, window shopping on Fulton where, you know, near my studio in Brooklyn. And when I go to other cities, I try to go into neighborhoods that are primarily people from African descent. And I look for what um, their interests are based on consumerism and what people think we're interested in based on what's being sold to us as consumers. And so I make those distinctions when I'm um, moving about my daily routine um, and then I keep, you know, I buy things, not to necessarily use them in my art right away, but I think about using them later on. I really feel like I'm interested in certain types of geometric forms and things that um, could be uh, incorporated into some of my uh, interest in geometric formation through painting. And so I look for fabrics, you know, that are maybe in, um, pattern motif or, you know, or more modern looking, um, geometric form motifs, because I, I think there's a really interesting um, history between materials and through textile and how they possess certain cultural perspectives and appreciation through even things that are made um, outsourced that, you know, a lot of African fabrics I buy from the neighborhood are from, you know, are printed in China. But the idea, you know, when you think about these, these, particular, these particular materials, they're really designed, you know, for African-Americans to feel more acquainted with the African, um, African diaspora. It's really a way that we become a consumer of this idea that we're um, somehow connected to the continent by uh, representation of our attire, which 
you know, also could be a radical thing because even wearing a print um, of African um, uh, pattern could, is looked at as radical from, from some perspectives. But if you put those two um, materials together, I usually like to use materials that are both African um, uh, influenced and visual and American influence and visual. And I like to put those two things together when I'm making uh, works. And so I'm really conscious of consumer identity within the black body. And I try to incorporate things that somehow intensifies this idea of consumption in a way that is not about, um, about the idea of the, of the person being taken advantage of. It's really more about what people pick to represent who they are and how we do have some choice in what we pick and how that choice can be a radical decision because if more than one person picked those things, then it becomes a group of people who like that thing. And so to me, I'm interested in that idea of consumerism as a form of identity and how everyone does it, not just black Americans, but all humans pick things that they want people to feel when they look at them is a reflection of their taste and the way they live. And I'm interested in that as being the motivation for the material I pick, the colors I pick are things that I know um, are of interest to me, that I know that, you know, I look at a lot of African textile just as pattern, as color, and those colors are some things that I use as the frame of creating a palette for some of the paintings I'm making. You know, mm -hmm. I really think about a lot of geometric African patterns and how they are so much a motivation for modernism and abstract painting the way that, you know, the hard edge abstraction. Um, I know that the, those artists had to be looking at some of the textiles from Native American culture and African culture because there's so much present um, color combinations in the way that you look at some of the paintings from the 40s and 50s and you look at some of the textile and some of the travel for some of the European artists who travel to different places you can see the influence. And for me, it's, I wanna look at those influences too. And so I wanna bring those things into my work. So that becomes like the motivation for what I'm doing um, in my studio. Thank you. Um, Allison, you, uh, you, your book is uh, replete with uh, just incredible imagery. Um, I was really struck by the image that you showed in your presentation of uh, the young men in the Cosmos Club and that, it, and which resonated because it, it reminded me so much of, of we came to party and plan this, this idea of just gathering around in, in what looked like a club or a backyard or some kind of party area. Where did you find these images? What, you know, what were the greatest challenges? Is there one in particular that you were just, you, you felt like there was a eureka moment? I, you know, you, you found the, the, the image that sparked this. So, the images were not necessarily what sparked the interest in this project. I, I got interested in this project when I was starting uh, graduate school as I was looking around for paper topics. Now, I have to say that it had been something, leisure and vacations has had been something I've been interested in since I was a child. Um, because when I was growing up in Southern California, my parents took us on day trips to different things, but we didn't go on overnight trips. And we might go to San Diego for the day, but we would leave early in the day and go, or we might go to Santa Barbara. And so I was just kind of interested in these things always. But the thing that kind of sparked it was that my mother's family my mother's family moved to Los Angeles in the 1920s. I'm a third generation Californian. She and her, her siblings and parents would go on vacations. They would go to Lake Elsinore and they would spend a few weeks every summer there. And to me, that was kind of fascinating because I heard her talk about it. So when I started looking for, uh, talk about the, her experiences there, and then, when, so when I started uh, this research, my mother was dead by that time. She died of cancer in the 90s, but my uncles were still around. And so I started asking them about the Lake Elsinore experience. And then I started asking them about some beach areas that I heard about. And, and so that's how the research evolved, it was just kind of from my own interest in my family experiences. And as I started doing the research, I realized that um, 
these were not stories that were documented in archives. And a lot of historians, that's where they do their work is in archives. So I had to go into my community resources through my uncles, through other elders in the community to ask them about these experiences. And I turned up a wealth of information. Uh, so I started on this research in 2004, 2000, yeah, 2004, around that time. And so with that, um, I started asking various people and I came up with different photographs. And then since that time, a few of the photographs uh, have wound up in collections, but most of the photographs that I have um, found uh, that I used that are shown in the book uh, are, are from private collections. And um, I can't say that I have uh, the, one of the photo, this photograph that's up right now, uh, the one that um, Masha really likes, that one, when, we, when I saw that photograph, um, I was inspired by it because I know several of these people in the photograph. And these are pictures of them as young men, like the little girl here. I know her and her father. And then this is her uncle. And this is a good friend of theirs, you know, so I knew all these people. And so just to like see them as young people in the 40s was, that was inspiring to me, you know? And just to think about some of the other stories that they had told me about things that were happening in terms of their lives. And these are people also that connected me to other people who had had these experiences. And so, so it really has been uh, a situation where I have gotten information from many different places and, and created my own archive. And, and this is also a, this during the segregation era almost. So, I mean, it is. Yes. And look at them. Like, you know, like when you hear about this era in school and you hear about this era and you know, it's an education or presented by artists in uh, most of the time of this era, you don't see this image. To me, this image is a political image. The fact yeah. that at this particular time where black people were dealing with so much oppression, these particular people are still thriving. They are the future in that they're, are, they're still, they're having time for each other to meet and talk and laugh. And I think that even within our culture, we don't look at this image as being a political image because we yes. we're taught not to look at this image that this image is a fun image and this image is not a serious image this yes. is a radical image to me and i yes. think this should be pushed to the front more i agree with you and i find in terms of my work that sometimes people want to uh not recognize the fact that what i'm talking about is radical because of the fact that these people decided that they were going to come to California and have all the advantages that were offered to them, even within the, the, you know, having to deal with the white supremacist stuff that was going on. Now, it wasn't as bad in California as it was in some other places in the United States, but it was still here in California. And so, you know, the fact that people were developing spaces for themselves and having a good time and then still going out and struggling. It's, it is, it's, it's the, all these stories are radical and they support the images that Derek is, is developing in his work that showcase uh, uh, this experience. And that, that just to me is so fascinating to see, you know, the intersection here in terms of- I love it, I you know, love the, it the foundational work that I'm doing with this documentation. And he is also, but you know, when people think about uh, trying to interpret uh, these stories, they have different ways of interpreting them. And so with my work and Derek's work, you can see the different ways of interpreting these radical stories of, 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 of leisure and imagination about what one's life could be. Yeah. And I think it's so interesting, too, because like in a lot of the history dealing with Blacks and leisure, you know, with starting from the idea of slavery and that history, like 
usually a lot of things that black people are allowed to do socially was a time where they took the, took the opportunity to also plan strategies, you know, where they were allowed to have a party once when the harvest was done or whatever the slave master thought was, you know, now was appropriate for them to have fun. You know, yeah, they laughed and they had a good time and they talked about things, but a lot of things they spoke about were not just about having fun. You know, churches were kind of formed on that same ideology. When black people converted to Christianity, the church became a political space where people were talking about legislation as well as family issues. And, and church was, for some people, just a vehicle for social gathering to get things done and to get things organized. Monies were raised to build um, developments. A lot of those things were done under the umbrella of social engagement. And I think that became part of the way we started to form communities and the way we started to form establishments was through places that at one time we were allowed to were allowed to be joined together, but it became places that also acted for, you know, politi politically. And that's why even today in politics, a lot of politicians, they go straight to the church when they are trying to campaign because they know that the church has a, a very particular place for black culture. They don't do that with most other cultures when they're trying to convince people to vote. They go to the black church more than they go to the white church to get to get numbers because they know that the priest, the preacher and the people in the church have a particular level of social engagement that is mixed with this idea of pleasure and family. And I think to me, it's because of those reasons, I think about the idea of leisure is not just being about leisure. I think it's about a lot of different things, you know? Yeah, so for instance, with the Cosmos Club in just in that vein of what Derek is talking about, they formed that club in the late 1940s after they had all been uh, off to college and uh, in World War II. And when they came back after World War II, Los Angeles was a different place for them because the black, the population, not just the black population, but the black population and the general population had grown so much that the place was a whole different milieu for them. And they formed this club so that they could uh, keep in touch with one another and also so that they could discuss some of the things that were of interest to them in terms of business opportunities because some of the men that were in that organization, they did business together. and. Um, uh, and then also they socialized together. Uh, there were a couple of insurance executives in that group. There was a funeral home director in the group. There was a fireman in the group who also did um, home renovations. Um, so all of those uh, things kind of intersected. Now the group is still alive today. Okay, they have a few of the older members. They're in their 90s that are still in the group. And then some of their children and other younger people have come uh, into the group. And they do, instead of, they used to have more parties than they do now, but they do one or so a year. But still, in terms of the kind of connections of community and, and inspiration, those things are still there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, you have both talked, just what you brought up, Allison, just now about that, that idea of party and 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 collective and and maybe next generation and, and reminded me of something that Derek you've talked about you have wonderful childhood memories um, starting in Baltimore of trips like big big trips that your family organized to places like Hershey Park um, could you talk about that power both of you just of the collective experience the power of co collective lived experiences um. I mean, just when we were talking before in the beginning, we were talking about, you know, just, you know, the idea of leisure from a personal point of view. Yeah, I was saying that in Baltimore, Maryland, where I grew up in the city of Baltimore, my grandmother, um, you know, who's, who's deceased, um, she started uh, a church with uh, one of the first founding members of the small church, Rehoboth Baptist Church. And so as a member of the church, you know, you automatically become part of, you know, various groups. You'd be like a kitchen committee, or you're like the, you know, the bake, the bake, you know, the um, bake sale committee. You become part of this thing, you know, and um, 
And every year, my grandmother would, uh, for the neighborhood, um, beyond the church um, community, she would plan a trip to Hershey Park, Pennsylvania. And it was something that she just did on her own. And part of the structure was we rented, she rented like three or four buses. They uh, were o was open for anyone in the community in an area that sh she lived in to buy a ticket. Um, there was usually like, you know, a long line of buses because most people in the community that um, I grew up um, in with my grandmother um, would be there. So it was, it was multi-generations of people, grandparents, kids, grandkids. We all knew each other, first and last names. And we did it for a while, I guess since I was probably really small, um, before starting elementary school, maybe a little after, up until probably my early teen years, we did this um, yearly um, trip. And when we didn't go to Hershey Park, we went to other parks, but we constantly created um, this community where people can engage with each other beyond just, you know, everyone was most, you know, everyone was working class. And so, uh, and they all knew each other because a lot of people worked at the same types of jobs or the same job, same uh, company. So it was a time for, uh, for everyone in the community to come together, to socialize, you know, people would bring food and those things. And for me, it was always something that was just so exciting because we have photographs of it and we talk about it with my family, even to this day, about these trips that my grandmother would plan. And for me, like just thinking about those things and thinking about all the different relationships we had growing up with the community, to me, it was just, it's just fascinating because, you know, going back to that neighborhood now, it looks, it looks nothing like it looked growing up. It, didn't have, it doesn't have the community that existed when I was younger. Um, a lot of the property is not even there anymore. But the idea that community became a central part of our culture and gathering um, and giving these trips, you know, and, and everything. We went, to the, we went to the beach, we did um, beach trips. We took, you know, we took weekend trips um, with buses and different things where we constantly were thinking about um, leisure and how to extend an invitation to other people to also participate in leisure with us. So um, I had a great uh, experience as a kid thinking about family and thinking about what is leisure, what does it mean to me? And as an artist, when I think about what I want to talk about, it's always really rooted in that experience and how that experience was such an impactful way for me to think about myself and to think about culture and to think about how it's not really about doing grand gestures of leisure, but it's about those small moments where you actually can detach from the, the trials and tribulations of the daily, you know, daily struggle and how you need that time to replenish yourself selves and to think about what is really important to you, which is usually the people around you. Yeah, so so when I was growing up, like I was saying earlier, my family would take day trips, but we 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 had um, quite a few family gatherings. But uh, my my even my primary uh, my family is small in terms of of here, but. My mother's family always had family gatherings and there would always be friends that would be coming to these parties. And so I have fond memories of all that. And on my father's side, he had a brother who lived here and he had his family activities and we would participate in those. And, and that uncle was a minister in a Methodist church in Pasadena. And so I have fond memories of, of, of experiences in, in community. And I have, uh, 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 in, in terms of my family. And then I was in Jack and Jill when I was a little kid, which was uh, up until junior high school, which was a social organization for um, black children. And I have fond memories of some of the parties that they had. I, I can remember an Easter egg hunt in particular. And, um, and the black businesses that were supporting uh, the event at the time, Golden Bird Fried Chicken was one of the black businesses that that supported the event during that time. And as a child, we uh, they took us on this one really uh, fun uh, day trip out to Lake Elsinore. And uh, I should have put the picture of us there. We have a picture. I, I'm in this little green bathing suit with my bathing cap on and I'm pulling on the bathing cap and my cousins are in the picture and my mother. 
and my aunts and uncles. And so that experience for me, that was the first time that the family had taken us to Lake Elsinore. And like I said, I had heard some stories about Lake Elsinore in terms of my mother's family going there. And so that was the first time my mother's, her two brothers and my grandmother, uh, my grandfather was dead by then, um, had been there and then they were taking their families to experiences. And this was in like the mid sixties and this was when the water had been refurbished and my uncles rented a boat for the day and we took food out there. My, my one uncle, my uncle Price uh, Cobbs was living in San Francisco and his family had driven cross country. And so they came back through Los Angeles and then my uncle Prince and his wife, uh, Veronica, who she's still alive, she's a hundred. She just had her hundredth birthday in in um, in in um, in February. So so we were all here in Los Angeles, and we drove out to Lake Elsinore for this trip for the day. And it was the first time I had ever been to this lake. Um, and I don't know whether I had been to a lake be at, uh, before that time. I can't remember, but I remember that day, and that made like a big impression on me from the standpoint of this you know, trip out here and just seeing this experience that my mom had had and that she had such fond memories of. And um, uh, I mean, I have, I have my own memories too of it now, but just in, in conjunction with that. Uh, and, and the things that we did as a family in terms of going to these different places around Southern California, I, I have so much, you know, uh, I have so many fond memories of that in our family parties uh, because the family parties would be kind of big sometimes, you know, all these different friends would be, you know, coming and going and what have you. And, and so, so even though we weren't so much involved in big communal activities, we had our familial unit um, parties and camping. I went camping a couple of times when I was a kid. It was uh, with with my my father's uh, family and my mother's family, where it was not tent camping but um, cabin camping. And that was in Northern California once, Mendocino, and then um, uh, I went someplace. Where was the other one? I can't remember now. And I was in the Girl Scouts, and I went you know, to different places with the Girl Scouts and what have you. So those were more my communal experiences with that. And those are things that have also been foundational to why I got interested in this uh, particular line of research in terms of, of showcasing uh, a different perspective of, African, of the African-American experience mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. crosses over a lot of areas. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. that's what's so interesting too about, you know, I was, how I ventured into the exhibition and body of work of surrounding the Green Book, which we also have connection with that. Because, you know, in uh, a couple of years ago, I, you know, I did an exhibition at Museum of Art and Design based on the Green Book and the research I was doing at Schomburg, discovering this publication that was printed by Victor Hugo Green. And, you know, he was a postal worker in Harlem. On his own, he decided to start compiling this information and eventually started to sell it, um, sell these uh, ads, uh, well not ads, but sell the publication to people. But it wasn't, it was only to replenish the publishing to keep it going. And what was really exciting about um, learning research, I started to discover how archives are created in a lot, in, in, in a black community, sometimes without even thinking that they're gonna be an archive. Like when you look at the Green Book, what, what you look at when you study the Green Book is that all of the listings of the businesses that existed, most which are not around anymore, really kind of, it kind of catalogs and archives the, the movement of the black figure in America. And it also presents a history of time and space that we occupied. And what he was, what Mr. Green was doing is creating an archive, you know, which he may not even thought that he was doing that. Right. But he actually I was just going to say, he probably didn't think of that he was doing that at the time, but yes. He created an archive. So like he, I mean, it's places that I grew up in, grew, you know, places that I grew up around in Baltimore. And when I look at the Green Book in Baltimore, that's addressed 
clusters of, of lo locations of spaces that are no longer there, but it also, but looking at it in the green book, it gives, it gives me a kind of a indication of the type of environment that existed around this particular place based on the amenities uh, and the services that were offered um, at that time. And for me, I think a lot of the interest I have in art, starting with leisure, really talks about the, 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 um, the growth of the Black community through consumerism and how consumerism plays a very part, uh, a major part in establishing um, progress of, of the idea of progress through the lens of the observer. And that to me is so interesting when I think about what, um, what happened and what was archived through uh, Mr. Green's ability to compile the information. And one thing that was really interesting when I did the show, it was really more an, uh, like more of an honor to Mr. Green, an homage to Mr. Green for being this citizen who was radical for doing such a thing that he probably didn't think even was radical uh, when he did it. And my show was really more about him and about highlighting him and his and what he did. And that was the focus for me as an artist to make the show. But one of the issues that came up in the show, people were asking me, like, why is there no you know, history of the of the lynchings or the the history of the the things that the, the things that were happening to people, and I said, "Listen, that's another show, right? You know, like <laughs> maybe some other artists will do that show, because right. my show is not about that. My show is, is really focused on this individual who took it upon himself to create opportunity where there were no opportunity, a person who's a citizen on his own without getting paid in the beginning, who worked all day as a postal worker, after work." decided to create something that was going to be helpful to his community. And, and the, for me, yeah. I was going to say, the thing that also is so interesting about Victor Green is that he used his network of people in the post office to get information to put yeah. in the Green Book. Which is awesome, you know? Yeah. And I thought that was amazing. And I, that, was, that was excited me about doing the show. And that was excited mm -hmm. me about doing the work. So my motivations, I sometimes feel, are very different um, than some other artists who may be interested in the Green Book. My, the Green Book for me was always about Mr. Green, you know, and what he did. And although, you know, the information is very relevant and the archive, the history that most people don't, are not familiar with, for me, it kept taking me back to who he was and what he did. And I think that, you know, revolutionaries you know, for the most part, come in all forms. And a lot of people I feel just even today, in, in my culture today, I find a lot of radicals and revolutionaries who are doing things that are just community driven without the idea of being categorized as a radical or revolutionary. And I think, you know, as a black person, just the act of trying to see something um, progressive happen could save lives could direct people in a, a way that give them more hope. And, I, and for me, that's what I think about when I create images. I think about how I can create hope and focus and drive by showing a certain level of reflectiveness that to me is very much familiar to what, the way I look at Black American culture. And I know a lot of people do too. Sometimes we, don't, we are not able to put them in words and, or into images. And as a visual artist, I'm really interested in how can I put this into images? And so that's my excitement about being an artist and being um, tasked with um, the gift of uh, communicating visual language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so we are being, yes, we are being, uh, oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to let you know, we are getting uh, many, many questions and thanks. Uh, you've been, uh, the, the, the chat is uh, filling up with people <laughs> thanking you and with many questions. So I think the one that I am, to, to synthesize one of the question, the many questions into one, um, people are asking right now. So what's next? What, 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 what's, what's percolating in your mind now? Is it too soon to say? Do you have another project that this audience should be looking forward to? You start, Allison. Um, so I, I was going to say first off that even some of the sites in California uh, are listed in the Green Book. Um, 
So mm -hmm. as it relates to uh, uh, that, I that I study in my work. Um, as it relates to my next projects, right now I'm working on a project that's an outgrowth of the book uh, called the Belmar History Plus Art uh, Project, and it's a civic commemoration project of the African American heritage uh, in the beach community of Santa Monica uh, mm -hmm. beyond the, uh, what I talk about in my book. And I'm looking at the early neighborhoods uh, of African Americans. We're going to have uh, some historical panels that are going to be put up around an area near Fourth and um, Bay. Uh, I'm sorry, Fourth and Pico, uh, with information about different people and uh, the places that they were associated with. And there'll be a piece of public art there by uh, April uh, April Banks. And we have, uh, we're doing curriculum development around it for um, the grade schools. And uh, uh, there's a website now, you can go and look at that. So all of this work will culminate uh, uh, later this year. And also I'm working on the uh, Angels Walk LA project, which is a heritage trail in the old Central Avenue neighborhood of Los Angeles. Uh, commemorating the African American life when that area was the hub um, during the Jim Crow era. And uh, then I have some other projects that I'm working on uh, developing that revolve around African American history uh, in California. Thank you. Well, we will look forward to that, and I hope that you will uh, continue to share those updates so that we can keep our, um, our community informed. Derek, uh, is there anything in terms of uh, closing that you would like to share that, that the public should be looking forward to? Well, I'm hoping the museum will open at some point so people can yeah. actually come and see the exhibition that's up. It's been extended to August, so mm -hmm. I'm excited about that. I'm also in the middle of finalizing um, a wallpaper um, work that I, I was commissioned by RX Art for the Harlem Hospital Children's Ward. And I think it's like seven rooms that are going to be fitted with wallpaper um, that, that are themed based around the floater series, um, which I'm really, I feel very honored to be invited to do something so uh, impactful for uh, kids and for kids to have an experience uh, with, you know, being in a, in a hospital and feeling, um, you know, a level of, um, of ease. Um, and I'm doing that. I'm also in the middle of kind of still working on this artist um, retreat residency in Baltimore that is kind of um, in the process of being uh, constructed um, that will, I think, open hopefully next year around this time um, and, um, and have a show opening um, in January, February at Salon 94 with Luxembourg and Diana Salon 94. So there's a few things that are in the works, but also teach at Brooklyn College, which I also enjoy. Um, it's my second year teaching in the, in the art department. And, um, and I encourage a lot of younger artists who are interested in a grad program experience to kind of find a little bit more about it, you know, um, if they're interested in pursuing that. So I have a lot of things going on, but you know, it's, it feels good to be uh, helpful and to be a facilitator at some point. So uh, I'm excited about, um, you know, life other than all the other craziness that's happening that we are constantly um, faced with, you know, um, and things that, again, um, there, you know, as you know, when I talk to people all the time about, you know, the idea of culture and the idea about um, preservation and, and, and thriving, you know, regardless of what's happening to, you know, what's happening with my career as an artist and things that are happening, you know, my level of vulnerability in the world is equal to any other victim of police, police brutality or just uh, any type of exposure to brutality. Um, so that's something that's something I would never um, assume is uh, I'm in a good place. Um, so that's always present. But the ability to feel and to understand that you have a position in the world and that you are responsible for um, displaying your talent to the world in the, in the way that you can do it and, the, and to the best of your ability has always been a really strong motivation for me as an artist, regardless of the social climate around me, I know that it's very important for me to be focused 
and for me to present images of radical, black radical imagination and push those ideas forward because I know we need that. And I know that not having a, a radical imagination is a, is, a, is, is, is a sign of defeat. And for me, I will not let that happen because I know that imagination is one thing that is always at risk when you're thinking about oppressive structures. When you look at cultures that are no longer producing um, art and culture, it's usually based on a level of trauma that they can't imagine themselves outside of what's happening to them. And for me, it's important to always be mindful that our history in the world is much longer and greater than our history in America. And for me to put that into the world. Thank you, Derek. Um, for our readers, uh, uh, readers and, and, and art lovers following along, again, I wanted to, um, to share with everyone uh, to, and to remind everyone to please get yourself these amazing books and come see this amazing exhibition. Again, Living the California Dream, African-American Leisure Sites During the Jim Crow Era by Dr. Allison Rose Jefferson, as well as Come See Our Show. As Derek mentioned, we're, we're thrilled uh, that we will, that thankfully in New York State, we will be doing a uh, phased opening and uh, Buoyant, H uh, Derek Adams Buoyant has been extended. Buoyant will be on view until August 23rd at the Hudson River Museum. Uh, and we came to party and plan, uh, will be extended into October. So we're really thrilled that you will have the chance to come and experience this immersive uh, exhibition. Uh, I, I would also like to mention that Derek Adams Buoyant will be traveling to, uh, to the Museum of Fine Arts St. Petersburg this fall. And so for those of you watching from uh, Florida and, and from that area, uh, please stay tuned for that. Again, here is the book. Uh, the, in the chat, you'll find the links to the fully illustrated catalog as well as the work, uh, as well as Living the California Dream. Um, I wanna say thank you to Derek and to Allison for being so generous with your time, uh, generous with your work uh, and adding to our collective understanding of, of radical black imagination and joy and, and and understanding um, that the how normative how how radical the normative is. So I, I want to say uh, a deep deep thanks um, again to you both. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, coming together in person again soon. We're looking at, forward to to being part of a solution, and we can't wait to see what else you are doing. And I I want to give a special thank you to uh, Laura Vocals for curator co curator with Jane uh, Bartlett. Um, for doing such a great uh, exhibition with me and the great writing in the catalog um, of the exhibition. I definitely feel uh, for the people who are, who are here with us, um, it's definitely a, a, a work that you will want to have. The book is really impactful um, and thoughtful. And um, not only the images are compelling, but the writing around the images are equally compelling and you will not be disappointed if you add this to your collection. Thank you. And thank you, thank Masha. You. So oh, much. thank you. And uh, thank you. Allison, any, any final goodbye from you? Um, I, I, I want to say thank you all to, for in, inviting me to participate. And Derek, I really appreciate you letting me. I appreciate you too. Thank you. <laughs> and letting me, letting me um, you know, come into your world and use your art for my book cover. And somebody had asked how I, um, uh, got to asking you. I was like, well, I had seen, I had been reading about his work and I suggested to the press that we look at his work and maybe there would be something that, you know, we could find and we did. And, and he said, well, yes. It was, <laughs> and, perfect. Yeah. it was a perfect match, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I thank you all for including me in this uh, process. And I hope that, uh, that uh, your, your, viewership will explore some of the Western pioneers uh, of African-American heritage and leisure and uh, uh, be enlightened. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. So uh, thank you again for joining us at the Hudson River Museum. And we look forward to programming. Deep, deep thanks to